let's imagine the scene. It's Sunday morning. The pastor gets up. It's Saturday afternoon. The, uh, the leader of the congregation gets up. Whatever it is, whatever it is. Uh, they say, turn with me to the book of Leviticus. Yeah, what happens? The people sitting in the pews, the people sitting in the seats, their eyes roll back in their head. Glassy look comes over their eyes. They all look at their watches and think to themselves. They start thinking about scripture. He who endures to the end will have lunch. We'll have own egg. Yeah, that's kind of what it is. Why? Because the book of Leviticus, which is a Hebrew document, has been changed into kind of a Greek mentality. And that is the word. Now, the word Leviticus actually has Hebrew uh, roots, Hebrew meaning, uh, in that it's about the priesthood. But since I'm not a priest, and, uh, you know, and there is no priesthood today, then the book is really not for me, and there's nothing for me in it. Oh, wait a minute. In uh, the scripture, it says that we are to be a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a treasure unto him. So maybe we need to look back at this, at this word and turn it into its Hebrew origin, and we might get a bit of a different message to it. Okay? So that's point number one in dealing with the book of Leviticus. Now let's go to number two. There was an, a, a, a meme out on Facebook the other day. A fascinating meme to me. I, I can't even, I can't get this one out of my head because I love spring. <clears throat> it is uh, my, probably my favorite time of the year. And so I, it, this meme was about trees. And you know, anybody that's listened to me knows I don't like being inside. All right. Uh, inside is boring. Inside, I spend most of my, give me around a window. If I got to be inside, give me around a window. I'm going to look out. Um, because I just am fascinated with creation. So, uh, and this is, this is a, uh, an atheist alert here, by the way, if it, there's any atheists that just happened to, you know, happen to you know, find my video today, uh, this is going to be a problem for you because this meme was about the fact <clears throat> that our lungs and trees look exactly the same. If you look out, go out and look in, up into a tree now, it's easier because uh, at this moment in time, the leaves are not fully on. And then you consider the uh, whatever all that stuff is in your lungs. Uh, and I'm not a doctor, nor have I played a doctor on TV, nor did I stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. So I have a very elementary uh, consideration regarding anatomy. I didn't, I fell asleep in that class probably. And so most of what I've done is on Google. No, it's not on Google because I don't like Google. I use DuckDuckGo. Um, so moving on. If you look at a tree, consider what's in our lungs. Uh, it looks exactly the same. So our lungs, we take in, we breathe in uh, carbon dioxide. We breathe out oxygen. The trees, on the other hand, breathe in carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen. But how does this take place? It takes place through the, um, the working of the heart. And the center of the heart, which is actually the, uh, the most important part, this is, is, is doing the process that is getting the blood into the lungs and therefore the transformation of the carbon dioxide to the, the, the extremities of the body. If it is not for that pumping of the heart, uh, the blood in, in dies, the body dies, you're dead. Same thing happens with the tree. When that sap does, is not, is, we have a tree right now in our yard that's in the process of dying. And we're watching it as the, uh, the pine needles have, have fallen off and now the pine cones and pretty soon the limbs uh, will start to fall. And, uh, Kathy's telling me I need to go out and cut that tree down. Yeah, I'm just procrastinating a little bit. Make, and I know that it's going to fall away. I, I, I think it's going to fall away from the house. So maybe I'll just let the creator do the pruning for me on that one. But uh, probably I'm going to have to get involved in this thing. Uh, that's another subject. But it's all about the heart. Now, going back to the scripture, if we look at the book, the books of the Torah, we know that it begins Genesis, Bereshit, Beit, the Hebrew Aleph Beit is the word, the letter Beit. The end of Deuteronomy is the letter Lamed. If we turn those words around, those letters around, what do we get? 
we get the uh, we get the word lev, which is the word for heart. So Bereshit and Deuteronomy are telling us, don't forget the heart. Because if you do, what are you going to do? You're going to die. Because the life-giving blood, the oxygen, is not going to get into the rest of the body. Okay, let's take another run at it. Number three. And here's the message of Bereshit, of, uh, of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, is that, first of all, we see the Creator. All right, well, He did His thing. What do creators do? They create. We read in Bereshit, He created the heavens and the earth. Why? A place that He may dwell with the people that He created, Adam and Eve. He gives them instructions. The first kosher dietary laws. Eat of that tree, don't eat of this one. What do they do? Eh, they basically said, the Torah is done away with. Uh, the instructions are done away with. <laughs> so they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that's called sin. Hmm, now we have a problem. Except for the fact that the Creator, knowing the end, or declaring the end out of the beginning, has already made a way for redemption. He says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and this is Mike Clayton translation, Adam, Eve, what you've messed up, I'm going to fix. Along comes, well, here we go with the story. Begins of a, of a deliverer who's going to fix the problem called sin. Now, uh, time goes on, and the Almighty finds this guy. His name is Ab Abram. Uh, Abram is told, get out of your country, away from your family, to a land I'm going to show you. Uh, those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. And through you, all the nations will be blessed. Okay? Now, some have thought, well, that, that is like, you know, God's going to give me a mansion, a three-car garage with cars to fill it, and a great bank account. Is that really a great blessing? Yeah, it is a, a luxury in life, but it's not really a, a blessing that has eternal benefits. The greatest blessing that could ever be to any person is this. I'm going to bring the deliverer through you. That is the blessing to the nations. That through your seed, Abram, I am going to bring the one that I spoke of in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And so, I will bless those that bless you, I will curse those that curse you, is not about Abram. It is about us and our response to the one that would come out of the seed of Abram. All right? So from the seed of Abram, we see that there are, would end up being 12 boys. I mean, we've got to skip through to, from Abraham, Abram, uh, Abram to going to Abraham, Isaac, uh, and then Jacob going to Israel. After he becomes Israel or is renamed Israel, we see that there are 12 boys who are called Israel <clears throat> when they all come together. Ha <laughs> ha. When they all come together, that's another story. Now, in the process of all this, uh, you know, they, uh, they turn against one of their brothers, which, turns in, which sends them down to Egypt, and they need deliverance again. So he delivers them. That's Passover, which we're getting ready to, uh, to uh, celebrate, to observe here in the next couple of weeks, next few weeks. And so he brings them, uh, now not as just a family, <clears throat> not as just 12 boys with their wives and a couple of kids. He now brings a nation, a whole nation, out of Egypt and into Israel. Of course, we have the problems with the golden calf, the spies, and all those things, which uh, eh, I won't even go into that. But eventually, we have a nation called Israel that is coming into a land called Canaan, which is a prophetic picture of a nation called Israel, <clears throat> which has, is made up of, uh, of those who are natural Israel, those who have been grafted in and adopted into Israel, who come into a, a land, which is the kingdom, and a Messiah that's ruling it. Okay, there's basically the gospel. But at the heart of the whole thing is Leviticus. And Leviticus is going to teach us something. What's it going to teach us? Well, 
there in is where we need to depart from the word Leviticus and go to its actual word, its actual name, which is Vaikra. Now, Vaikra is going to give us a clue to everything. And that is in the letter Vav. Okay, what is the Vav? The Vav is, I, I believe, the most used letter in all of the Torah. I know that it is in the book of Ruth, various other places. The Vav is the connector. We read about the Vav all through the book of Exodus when we're reading about the tabernacle. And it was the, the, the word, and. And you are to, and you are to, and you are to, is translated, could be translated this way. Vav you are to, vav you are to, vav you are to. And, the connector, connects this to this. This curtain to this curtain is connected with what? A hook, which is a vav. And so, we see that the word vaikra begins with the letter vav. Now, we turn a page, and it's like, okay, we've finished the book of Bereshit, Genesis, and we're going to turn to Shemot, Leviticus, or Exodus. Yeah, whole new book, right? No, it's still the same story. Everything being connected. <clears throat> the reason for the Vav, in my opinion, that he began this word Vaikra with Vav is to give us a clue that that which happened at the end of the book of Shemot, Exodus, which was the filling of the tabernacle with the Shekinah, is to be connected with the book of Vaigra, which is about the priesthood, the service unto him in the tabernacle. So if we delete the book of Vaigra, what have we done? Hmm. Well, to put it into today's terminology of the news, what, what do we have in the news? Squatters. <clears throat> we have people coming into houses that are owned by other people. Those people went on vacation for, you know, a while, like maybe 2,000 years. Hmm. <laughs> and people came in and took over with their own rules. And then the whole, you know, the, the, the news and the laws and all these things are being challenged. Who's, who's, uh, whose house is it? Does it belong to the one who has the title deed? Or does it belong to the squatters? Uh, that's called the war that's going on in Israel presently. That's called what is going on in the world. Who's got the title deed? Hasatan's the squatter. The Almighty has the title deed to it. And the war that's going on right now is between who has the actual rights. Eh, of course, we could do the old idiom. <clears throat> I've read the back of the book. I know who's got the title deed. And I know who wins. I know where the squatter goes. All right? Moving on. So, Vaikra is all about those who, have the, who are operating under the title deed to the house. Now, the word Vaikra uh, means, is, um, it means an encounter. All right? Now, consider this, that there's a, a, different, a difference between an encounter and a meeting. You ever been uh, you know, in, introduced to somebody, and you're like, hi, how you doing? Okay, you exchange names, little pleasantries, you walk off, and it's like, well, that was nice. You know, you know that you're never going to see these people again. And if you do, you're not going to remember much about them, nor are they going to remember anything about you, okay? It was just a meeting. And then you have encounters. We had this happen to us last year at, or to me at Revive, is I'm walking around, standing there in front of someone, introduced they were introduced to me and I looked down and said and it says North Carolina I said where are you from in North Carolina he said well we currently live in a little town he said you probably wouldn't know where it is okay try me well we're out in western North Carolina okay uh try me uh it's Hayesville 
Okay, I know where, I, where that's at. You do? Yeah, I'm in Franklin. Okay, less than an hour away. Now they're a part of our congregation life assembly. Uh, and, and a great blessing, by the way. That was an encounter, not just a meeting. And so an encounter is, uh, is something that, that is lasting. And the Almighty is telling us in Vaikra, I don't want to just have a meeting with you. I want to have an encounter with you. And through the message of Leviticus, Vaikra, I want you to not just look upon my house, but I want you to be a part of my house. How does that play out? Well, the first thing we read is in uh, verse 2, Speak to the people of Israel, say to them, when you are to bring and when any of you brings an offering to Yudhevavhe, you bring it uh, and it goes on from there. The word is korban. <clears throat> the word korban is kufresh beit nun. Uh, it is a fascinating word. First of all, the word, the letter kuf is about uh, a sun on the horizon. Now, does the, the word actually mean, uh, or the letter, does it mean sun on the horizon in the morning or in the evening? Mm, it doesn't say. But what is it about a sunrise and a sunset? Even if you pay no attention to, unless I guess you're in a big city and uh, then you have no idea what's going on in creation to begin with, but if you uh, live out in a place that you can actually see the horizon, as we do, uh, it is... I do. I, I spend, like I said, I spend most of my day looking out the window. I have a window right here, and people once in a while will say, "What were you looking at?" Well, right over there is uh, I've got my deer feeder. Actually, it's my squirrel feeder. I uh, haven't seen any deer lately. If I do, I'm like you know, I'm trying to look at you or this camera and monitor and look at the deer at the same time. Or sometimes it's like squirrel. And I start looking at the squirrels running up and down the trees. And right now it reminds me I have no food in the squirrel feeder, so I need to do that so I have something to look out out the window. But the average person doesn't spend a lot of time looking up at the sky, especially during the middle of the day. When do you look at the, at the sky? The morning and the evening. How do you look? That's a beautiful, bright sky out there. Give me my sunglasses. No, it's look at the sunrise. Look at the sunset. How many people go through the, the morning and evening not looking at either? We've had some uh, controlled burnings in the area here. Sunsets are amazing uh, with, that, with that controlled burn. The, the beauty, the colors that are there. So the, the kuf is about the sunrise, the sunset. It's about a beautiful thing. It's about the handiwork. I, I, I look at a sunrise and a sunset, and it's like, wow, the creator's a pretty good artist, too. Is he paints the most beautiful pictures, uh, none of them ever being the same. So it's about a, a beautiful thing. Uh, it is in the resh, which is a head. Resh, rosh kodesh, uh, which is the head of something. The bait, which is the house. And the noon, which is life. So here's the korban. Uh, it is the offering which we are to bring unto him. And that offering is to be something this beautiful. It is to be given to the head of the house who is giving us life. Now let's just consider it like this. Uh, we're going through Passover right now. We're, we're setting up everything, and we're inviting different people. With our congregation, we'll probably have uh, two, at least two, maybe three Passovers going on. Uh, we're inviting people to our house, those that are going to be a part of it. And what's the first thing that happens when you, when you invite somebody? If you're invited to someone's house, <clears throat> uh, and you were raised properly, and they say, I'd like you to come over for dinner. What's the first thing out of your mouth? What can I bring? Hmm. What can I bring? Isn't that this, what, uh, what Leviticus is teaching us? We've been given an, op an opportunity. We've been given an invitation. See, the word grace is about an invitation. 
It's, it's not just unmerited favor. No, it is unmerited favor, yes. His invitation to us is unmerited favor. The word faith, according to Brad Scott of Blessed Memory, the word faith is about we receive, we, we act upon, we accept and act upon that invitation. So what should be the first thing that we consider after we accept the invitation is, what can I bring? Well, he says, I want you to bring something beautiful. I want you to bring something and present it to the head of the house. And through that, you're going to receive life. Now, with this, uh, with this invitation is a responsibility that we are to abide by the rules of the house. So the Korban is teaching us that when you bring, when you are invited to the house, you're to bring something to the house, which is in, in typical, I mean, where two or more are gathered, there shall be food. Yeah, we all, we all know that one. Uh, that's not actually what the verse says, but that's what we do with the verse. We are to come to the house and we are to bring ourselves. But I want to ask you, uh, when you, when you uh, accept that invitation to a person's house and you say, you know, what can I bring? Well, no, nothing. No, you don't need to bring anything. Just bring yourself. Uh, no, I'm going to bring something. What do you need? Okay, so you negotiate a little bit. And uh, it, this, this takes me back to my days uh, growing up in, in church and, and pastoring at Shady Sea in, in, um, in Wakulla County, Florida. Is that in, we had at in, uh, it's, it's, uh, Shady Sea at Spring Creek, uh, we had some amazing cooks. Now, most of them, none of them, had ever, wor ever, had ever heard the word kosher, so we didn't really have things all the time that were clean. In fact, we lived in a crabbing community, which, yeah, I'll, I'll just leave that at that. But they had a spread. I mean, we had, you know, this, this church building, and beside it was a, uh, like a, a, a patio <clears throat> with concrete tables. And these tables were the whole length of the church, which was not that long. But it was uh, probably about 40 feet of tables. Now, with, at homecoming, or what we refer to sometimes, we're going to have dinner on the grounds. And that ended up becoming dinner on the ground. Uh, so people thought that you should, you know, they, they really didn't. We knew that it was what it was. But if you didn't understand Southern, you thought we were eating on the ground. So no, it was dinner on the grounds, which got shortened after a while. And... Everybody would show up. Why? Because where two or more are gathered, there shall be food. And when you're feeding people, uh, as I've seen with many congregations, not just churches, people will show up when you feed them. As my dear friend John Faust used to say, there's coming a time in which you're going to have to hold up a biscuit to have them come to church. The only thing that John was wrong in is that biscuits don't bring them, uh, it's donuts. So, uh, we would have these spreads, and it was amazing. This was my first encounter with uh, a dear lady friend, uh, Kathy, uh, that came up to me the first time that I did a homecoming at Shady Sea and said, Preacher, um, I saved a piece of cake for you, and Kathy made a 17-layer chocolate cake. <laughs> it was worth showing up for. But uh, So we had an absolute spread there at Shady Sea. Now, I'm, we moved, Kathy and I moved, from there to Tucson, and we would also have, there it was, we're going to have a meal after service because they didn't speak Southern real well. And you know what people would bring? Kentucky Fried Chicken in a bucket with mashed potatoes from KFC in the little container with that thing that they thought was gravy on top with green beans that had no flavor. I mean, people would go to the local whatever restaurant and they would bring things and, and call that food. I'm like, these people don't have a clue what they're doing. 
what's the story about? Are we bringing our best? Or are we running by KFC? When you come to service on Shabbat, or if you go, uh, if you're, you know, doing Sunday, whatever it is, when you go, what are you bringing? Bringing. I got back to Southern there. When you show up, what are you bringing? Are you bringing your best? Did you spend time cooking this? Cooking. I'm, I'm thinking back to, to I'm st my head is still back to that chocolate cake and all the stuff that went along with it. So it's just coming out in the accent. Are, you, are we bringing our best? Something that we've put thought in. Something that we have, have, have spent time with. Or are you just running by the, you know, running by Ingalls or Publix or Winn-Dixie or Safeway or wherever you are and grabbing something out of the deli, tossing it together, ordering a, a, a cheese tray or a fruit tray or something and going, hey, I, here it is, I got it. And you put no effort into it. No, oh, I bought it. But you put no effort into it. It is when you bring something of effort. One of my board members would always show up. Uh, we had, also we did Wednesday night, uh, once a month, we did a business meeting. Be why? Not because we like business meetings, but we ate afterwards. And BB would always, a lot of times, would bring a, a tomato pie. Now, if you've never had a tomato pie, you really haven't lived. And, I mean, it was like, BB, did you bring tomato pie? Good, okay. It was, it was amazing. But he, he, had put, he had put effort into it. Are you getting my point? What are we doing? Are we putting effort or are we just showing up? So, the book of Leviticus, Vaikra, is about the rules for visiting the house. Different way of looking at this thing. Uh, when I was in Japan, when I was in South Korea, you walked into the door, and the first thing you did, there was a little, little, usually a little extra area right there. Uh, when I was in Japan, it was raised up about, you know, just one step, and you took your shoes off. I offended my hostess, being a typical American in that day, not understanding that America is not the center of the world. She thought Japan was. How silly. And I stepped off of that into the house with shoes on. She got really offended, and I tried to make a joke at it, of it because I was a dumb American. But that's the tradition of the day. That's the tradition that she has. Uh, I, I was at someone's house the other day. There's a sign in the as you walk in. Take your shoes off, please. Okay. If I walk in and decide, I'm not taking my shoes off, what have I done? I have insulted the host and hostess, the owner of the house. When we look at Leviticus and say, well, you know, I've got my own ways of doing things. What are we doing? We're insulting the owner of the house. He says, you are to bring an offering. And he says in verse 4, the person is to, he is to lay his hand upon the head of the burnt offering. What is he doing? He's, you're leaning into it. So let's say, I invite you to my house for dinner. The first thing you do, because you're polite, is you say, what can I bring? So we negotiate. You say salad, I say dessert. You say salad, I say dessert. It's just the way it's going to be. So whatever we end up that you're going to bring, you come walking into the house, and you walk over to the kitchen counter, and you throw it down on the table. Well, that was rude. No. See, if you were raised by my grandmother, of blessed memory, uh, she told me, <laughs> she threatened me. It was, uh, you know, it was borderline there. Uh, she threatened me, but she taught me. 
you say please and thank you. I mean, it was drilled into my head through sometimes the, uh, what Granny would call the tanning of my hide. Or at times, if she was really upset, the skinning of my jacket. You guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, so I was told that you're to be polite. I was taught that when you entered into the house, that you greeted the people that were there. You didn't just walk in and ignore people. Uh, you know, basic manners today are, are really not being taught very well. And if you're not teaching your children uh, manners, it's your fault. Don't, you know, don't, don't blame them for something you, you haven't taught them by your actions. So I was taught when you walk into a room, you greet people that are in the room. And you be nice. You shake hands with someone. You, uh, you say please. You say thank you. And so if you bring your, I want out and you bring dessert, but you're like offended because I want out and you throw it down on the counter, I'm going to think, wow, they're not really into this. No, you bring something and you present it. You present it to the person of the house. That's just nice. It's just manners. And so how are we bringing our offering. Let's say that you didn't go by KFC and you actually spent some time, but then you present it in an unthankful manner. This is what he's saying. Be thankful. Be a part of the offering. Uh, we will read in the uh, in here about the sacrifices. It's kind of like a barbecue, you know. Uh, why did he choose this? I don't know. It is, is, you know, if, if you invite me to your house and I, and, and you're having barbecue and I'm like, uh, you know, I, I was hoping for, you know, something different. Well, it's your house. So let's get over trying to figure out why. I know the purpose. Okay, I, I can see Messiah in all of this. Yeah, I got it. But this is what he wants for his house. And I should not go in there and try to rearrange his house. I acknowledge that I really have no right to be there, but it's only because of his invitation. He goes on in chapter 2 and talks about a grain offering. Now, the, the uh, different translations d translate this different ways. Some say grain, some say meat. The first time that this is uh, given to us is in Genesis chapter 4, verse 3, when uh, the story of Cain and Abel, and uh, Abel brings a offering from the fruit of the ground which is acknowledging he was acknowledging this is this is something i you know i just was part of i was kind of cooperating with this right now we're you know we're planting a garden i've got i got plants got some seeds so we're going to be planting this garden but it's soil that i didn't create it's seed i didn't create it's water that, you know, rain that I have no, really con no real control over, over. It's sunshine that I really don't have any control over. But I'm just doing the process. I am using what he has given to me to bring forth fruit that I can then offer unto him. It's called a tithe, an offering of that which he gives to us. And so this is what Abel was acknowledging. This is what Cain got mad over. So we are to give a, bring our offering, understanding that it's what he owned in the first place and has every right, every right to the whole thing. But we're, he only asks us to give back a part of it and then we are to use the rest of it in such a way that we glorify him. In chapter 3 we see a peace offering. Okay, that, that word can be translated a friendship offering. You, again, go to somebody's house. What's your, you know, what, what, how, what's your attitude? What's your attitude as you, as you go to the house? Are you peaceful? Are you holding a grudge because their dog did something on your driveway or your yard? 
What's the attitude? So we are to be we are to be appreciative. We're to be peaceful as we come. So the details, uh, the the details of how we're bringing those things. Why why should he have all those details? Because he owns the house. I mean, I, I listened to a couple of uh, some some folks the other day on uh, on television, and it's amazing how these educated people on television really don't know anything, uh, don't know much, and they were discussing the Iditarod sled dog, sled dog race, which is something that. Uh, if you've never studied anything about the sled dog race and you've never been to Alaska, uh, you really should not be reporting the news of it if you don't know anything about it. Well, they were announcing that the, the person that won this won even though they had been given a two-hour uh, penalty. What was the penalty? The penalty is that he killed a moose. Now, why did he kill a moose? He's allowed to, through the rules of the Iditarod, which is very, very strict in those rules. Uh, Kathy and I lived up there. We were right, very close to the beginning of the trail in Eagle River. Uh, beautiful. It, be, the dogs, everything about the race is, uh, is amazing. But uh, they have specific rules about the handling of the dogs, about what happens when you encounter wildlife. Uh, a moose is probably one of the most uh, uh, most dangerous animals on the planet. Uh, not only the, the moose isn't going to eat you, no, especially a cow moose. Uh, the the moose is going to stomp you into the ground, literally. Then the bear comes along and eats you. But this uh, this moose, they had an encounter with a moose. The guy shot the moose. But he did not, uh, he, he did not uh, skin and gut the animal in a proper manner. Now, why is this important in the Iditarod? Is because the rangers, those that are, are uh, the rangers of the race, are going to come along. They're going to find that moose. And if it is skinned and uh, if it is gutted properly, then that meat can be given to those that are in need. And it's, you know, it's, it's a, a lot, hundreds of, hundreds of pounds of meat. But this was not gutted in a proper manner, so the meat was spoiled. And these, uh, these I'm going to use, I'm not going to use the term that's in my head. What's in my head is mental midgets, but I'm not going to use that term regarding them. Uh, so they're talking about, well, why is this? It doesn't matter. Why are you asking the question? They, they, got the, they, they missed the whole point. The point is that this was the rules of the race in which they had nothing to do with. So that which you don't have anything to do with, you don't have the right to set the rules for. In, the, in creation, I didn't have anything to do with the creation. I didn't have anything to do with, you know, in the beginning. No, I'm in, I was invited through my mother and father. I was invited to be a part of this world, which means I don't have any right to ask questions regarding the details and the, the rules in which the Creator is set up. Same thing holds true. You come to my house for dinner. There's things that, that you don't do in my house. Okay? Because it's my house. Uh, you, my wife is going to tell you, don't, you know, take your shoes off. She's going to tell the grandkids. They're out in the yard playing. We have red clay. Take your shoes off before you come in the house. Okay? Uh, you don't, there's things you don't bring into my house. If for some reason, you know, you're, you're sitting down and you're watching the television in my house, there's channels you don't turn to. You don't come to my house and expect to watch Bachelorette. It's not happening in my house. And that's just one of a, of a whole list of things. Okay? And if you don't like the rules of the house, the same door that you came in, you can go out through. So if we don't like the, the rules of the house of the Creator, the same door 
that you walked in through, you can walk out through. So much for eternal security. Okay? He never takes away our choice to walk out that door. Now, uh, so the details of how you are to, to clean the animal, of how you're to bring this, why are we asking the question? It's his house. You get the point? Now, he goes through and talks about a number of things. One of them, I, I, want, I don't have a lot of time, uh, is in, inadvertent sin. Okay, in chapter 4, if you commit a sin inadvertently, uh, basically it's, it's like this. I don't know, I don't remember that I did I don't know that I did that. Again, Kathy and I were in, uh, in uh, St. John's, Arizona years ago. And we had a favorite Mexican restaurant we'd go to, and we both love uh, tamales. Problem with tamales is they normally have pork. I uh, actually got some moose meat years ago in Alaska, and Kathy made moose tamales. They were wonderful. But another subject. So we asked, and we said, are the, are the tamales pork? No. Okay, so we're eating, probably for a year, we're eating tamales in this, in this restaurant. Uh, one day, the revelation comes to us, because you know, we're kind of new in this. Wait a minute. The casing for the tamale, some of the times it's made with lard. Just like the pie, pie crust my grandmother made. Hmm. So we asked the waitress, could you check and see if it's lard or vegetable oil? She comes back and she says, it's vegetable oil. Vegetable oil. Uh, since we knew her, we've been going there quite a while, a small town. Uh, she said, why do you ask? <laughs> we said, well, because lard comes from pork and we don't eat pork. She got this look on her face. But the tamales are pork. What? What, what did you just say? The tamales are pork. Uh, we asked a year ago and were told they were beef. Well, she went back. The owner came out and was, I mean, apologizing all over. There's nothing we could do. Why get mad? Okay, we were given wrong information. We sinned inadvertently. There was nothing we could do about it. I'm not going to sue the restaurant. Okay, but it was, it, in fact, it's kind of funny to us right now. So when it becomes known to you, inadvertent sin, when it becomes known to you, we didn't know. But when it became known to us, we didn't keep eating the tamale. Okay, we asked for, uh, could you take this plate back and could we have something different? We didn't come in a week later. And, and, and at, you know, get tamales. When it became known to us, which brings up an interesting concept. And that is conviction versus condemnation. The enemy would love to, loves to deal with this. Condemnation. I'll give you a, 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 a difference here. You're driving down the road and you see bridge out ahead. And then you see U-turn. You can take the U-turn, or you can keep going and run over the cliff. Conviction is that there is a U-turn. You see a sign that says, Sin ahead. Bridge out. You've done something. And so you look up, and there's a sign that says U-turn. It's called repent. U -turn, a a U-turn sign, you're going to now drive different. Whenever you see a U-turn sign, they could just put on that sign, repent. Okay, they couldn't because a lot of people can't read today in the United States. But it's a repent sign. Because you're going one way, and now you've decided because your little lady in the GPS says, turn around, you're going the wrong way. At the stop sign, take a U-turn. At the red light, take a U-turn. Scripture is about stop. Take a U-turn. Repent. That was the message of Yochanan, the immerser, John the Baptist. Repent. You're going the wrong way. But see, with conviction, conviction is from the Ruach, the Spirit. There's always a way of repentance. Condemnation is the bridge is out and you're going over it. 
The enemy will always come to you with condemnation. There's never a way out. The spirit of, of Yah will always come with, um, with, with conviction, with a U-turn. Now, lastly, well, actually, I've got two things to put in here real quick. No, I'm going to do one. I'll get to the other one later. In chapter 5, verse 5, a person guilty of any of these things is to confess it in what manner he has sinned. Confess. The word is yada. Now, if you've studied anything about worship, you're thinking right now. What is the word yada? The, the word yada means to throw or to cast. So you are to cast this upon him because he cares for you. We are to throw. We are to confess. And interesting enough that in Psalm 60, in Psalms, the book of, uh, book of Psalms, the word yada is used 67 times. It's the word that is translated praise or thanks. So what a beautiful picture. When we sin inadvertently, on purpose, that's another subject, we are to con confess that sin. We're to throw it upon him. And in doing so, we should do it in such a way that it is with praise. Thank you, Father, that you have, you have revealed to me what sin is. Thank you, you have revealed to me the, the rules, the instructions of your house. I took my shoes. I, I left my shoes on when I shouldn't have. I um, I turned that channel, and and didn't turn away from it uh, like I should have. Thank you that you have revealed those rules. I wish to stay in your house because I love my master. <laughs> Going back to the words of the bond servant, uh, I love my master. I I don't want to go anywhere. Okay, I got I got time for one thing. I want to I do want to bring out. Uh, this came out in in um, Life on Purpose on Monday night. John chapter fourteen, verse fifteen through twenty one. Go back and read those. Here's here's an assignment. John fourteen fifteen through twenty one and John chapter fifteen verse ten. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now, those are words that in this movement, all of us know those words. If you love me, keep my commandments. All right? So our commandments, the, the, command, the rules of the, of the house are not being adhered to out of duty, but out of love. Because I love my master. I love the one of the house. And because of that, I love the instructions of the house and I adhere to those instructions in a way that is with thanksgiving and praise. But I, I want to, if you would allow me, uh, to retranslate those words a little bit. And this is, again, what came out with Life on Purpose. John chapter 14, verse 15. Out of my love for you. Out of out of. Well, let me put, out of your love for me, keep my instructions. And in John chapter 15, verse 10, it says that Yeshua kept the instructions because they were the Father's instructions. The words given on Mount Sinai to Moshe are the rules of the house. Those rules have never changed. But just as it is with the changing of Vayikra, into Leviticus, which kind of clouds the issue and brings forth misunderstanding. When we don't understand who owns the house or the purpose of the rules of the house, we come to a misunderstanding of the rules of the house. Shabbat Shalom. Shavuot Tov. Have a blessed, prosperous week. Bezrat Hashem. God willing. See you again next week. And until then, Chazak, Chazak. Be strong and be strengthened. <laughs>
Shalom.